I'm blind, but I just saw something in the darkness. I fully lost my sight 20 years ago. So imagine my initial euphoria after two decades of living in a blackened world upon seeing something on last night's walk home. Though this may beg a belief, I hope I never see anything again. My guide dog, Ted, took the lead to suggest we should continue walking home, but I was transfixed by a red pinprick in the distance. Now, without offering too graphic a description of my childhood injury, my eyes are non-existent. This isn't a case of partial blindness. I don't see lights, shadows, or shapes. I have spent 20 years in absolute darkness without hope of ever seeing anything again. And yet, inexplicably, a red shape loomed on the horizon. Excited and shocked in equal measure, I diverted from my daily path and headed towards the first thing I had seen since the age of 10. Ted whined grumpily, confused by our sudden detour, but he begrudgingly led me along winding streets, far from the ceaseless chatter and loud vehicles of the city. It took about 15 minutes of walking into the depths of what I assume must have been a sleepy neighbourhood, for the red speck on the horizon to grow into a distinguishable shape. It was a house. A red-bricked new build sitting in the midst of the endlessly black void that had been my entire world for so many years. And after another 15 minutes of walking along seemingly endless roads, we were finally standing before the mysterious building. Ted growled, and I felt the lead move in the opposite direction as he tried to guide us back the way we came. I can see it, boy, I whispered tearfully. Tell me you see it too. I'm not crazy, am I? Ted started barking and yanking more assertively on the lead. But I gripped tightly and pulled him towards the house before stumbling painfully into something metallic. I fumbled with my free hand, fairly certain that I'd found the house's front gate. Contending with a distressed and noisy dog at my side, I eventually found and lifted the latch, shoving the gate open. The house was entirely unremarkable in and of itself. I'd expected a glitzy, futuristic building, given it had been so long since I'd seen the world, but it looked no different from every other British home I remembered from my childhood. Red bricks, brown roof tiles, and white framed windows. The number 11 was plastered in gold on a black, featureless front door. Ted must have planted his paws firmly on the ground, because I had to practically drag him along the path leading up to the front door. I know you're scared. I don't understand it either, Ted, I said. But I might never see anything ever again. I just... I have to know what's happening. I have to find out how and why I can see this place. Please just let me see whether anyone answers. I promise we'll go home afterwards. Trembling, with a feeling that had morphed from excitement into sheer anxiety, I weakly knocked on the black front door before me. A wave of pins and needles passed through my hand as I realised something. The door was real. I felt it. I'd convinced myself that the house must be a figment of my imagination, but there was no denying that my knuckles had wrapped against the familiar feel of a soft wood surface. My heart pounded erratically as the reality of my situation dawned on me. This wasn't a fantasy anymore. I was standing before something I could see. I looked around to find that the rest of my world remained a dark and empty chasm. I couldn't even see Ted at my feet though I could certainly hear his agitated sounds. So why could I see the house? And then there was a sudden sharp noise, metal barreling rapidly against wood. It had to be the door lock. Hello? I called it, 
I was wondering whether I might be able to speak to the owner of the house. Footsteps pattered softly away, I think. And usually I'd be able to hear a pin drop in another room. In the absence of sight, many blind people will tell you that their other senses become heightened. And yet, it was as if the sudden introduction of colour and shapes to my world had lessened my usually sharp hearing. But there was much more to this unexplained event than that. Sights? What sights? I don't have eyes, I thought to myself. Hello? I called again. Please, I just want to talk. A door opened. It sounded like a side door leading out onto the walkway. I know it was foolish, but you don't know how it feels to spend years in darkness and finally be offered a glimmer of light. I couldn't resist, though Ted did. Stumbling across the front lawn, tripping over a bramble-ridden bush, I made my way around to the side of the property. Sure enough, an open side door blew lazily in the early evening breeze. Ted's barks were growing hoarse, and he had instead resorted to a fearful whimper. I'm not sure why I wasn't afraid at that moment, but I would be. As I stepped through the doorway, I entered a glistening kitchen. White, pristine, sterile. Hello? I called for a third time. I really need to talk to you. Do you know what's happening to me? What is this place? Through the open kitchen doorway, the main lobby was illuminated by an overhead light. Ted stood invisibly beside me, but I could see every part of the house itself, every furnishing and light fixture, and that included the reflection in the tall mirror hanging in the entryway. The artificial light cast onto the glass pane was part of the house, after all. And so, for the first time in twenty years, I saw myself and the uncertain little golden retriever beside me. The last time I'd seen my face I was a child, but before me stood a bearded man with a weary face and two glass eyes. I couldn't quite make the connection that I was looking at myself. Stroking my beard thoughtfully, I took slow strides towards the mirror. How could it be that a man with no eyes was able to see himself? To see anything? The terror started to work its way into my brain. Gone was the sheer joy I'd felt upon seeing things again. The impossibility of my situation was ringing alarm bells, as it already had for Ted. As overjoyed as I felt to see anything other than constant darkness, I was acutely aware of the fact that everything about that house was terribly wrong. And then I caught the reflection of a small shape flitting behind me. It had the appearance of a young boy, but I didn't need to get a proper look to know that there was something distinctly unnatural about him. I screamed, spinning around. The floorboards creaked beneath the weight of something slipping up the stairs giggling as it went. An invisible thing. I'd only been able to see it in the mirror. It isn't part of the house, I realised. Ted started barking, pulling on his lead to chase whatever had disappeared up the stairs. Who's there? I croaked frightfully. No response, other than fading giggles and footsteps across the upstairs landing but I finally accepted that there were no answers to be found in that place. None that would make any sense anyway. And so I turned to face the kitchen again, pulling Ted's lead. Come on, I gulped. You've got your wish, boy. Let's get out of here. As I started to walk towards the open side door in the kitchen, strangely relieved to see the black outer world that awaited me, I was baffled to find that Ted was standing still and he wouldn't budge. I turned to look at the mirror in the lobby, and I could see the reflection of my dog standing in a frozen position before the stairs. Are you kidding me? I cried. You were right, Ted. This place is wrong. Let's go. Reaching from somewhere beyond the reflection of the mirror, two hands, 
withered but clearly those of a child, swiftly swooped towards my dog, and by the time I'd blinked, Ted had been unclipped from his lead. He vanished up the stairs with a loud whimper. Ted! I screeched, running back into the lobby. I hauled my body up the stairs two at a time, forgetting something crucial. I could see the house, but I could not see its inhabitant. And when I reached the upstairs landing, I found myself plummeting onto the quintessentially British carpet beneath me. Something had tripped me up. An eye for an eye. A truth for a truth. A boy's strangely ancient voice softly whispered. I felt a cold hand wrap itself around one of my ankles, and I screamed piercingly as I thrust my foot at the invisible attacker behind me. Ted was barking from a nearby room with a closed door. Didn't get me. Blind as a bat, Mikey. The voice giggled again. Who are you? I sobbed, crawling across the carpet from a threat I could not see. How do you know me? I could see imprints in the carpet as the invisible boy crept towards me on hands and knees. Eyes and lies. Lies and eyes. He wheezed, seizing both of my ankles. I shrieked in terror as an unseen force with abnormal strength dragged me across the landing towards the room at the far end. As the door opened, I heard Ted barking manically. Want its eyes? The boy giggled. Leave him alone, I cried. I found myself lying on the floor of a room unlike the rest of the pristine house. It was derelict. There was a mattress in one corner, a sink with a mirror on the wall, and a small radiator that was rattling. Ted had been tied to it. Just let us go, I pleaded. Not until I thank you, the boy whispered, pacing across the rickety floorboards. For what? I asked. Above the dingy sink, a face suddenly appeared in the cloudy, unclean mirror. The boy was barely distinguishable, but I saw enough. Bulging too far out of their sockets were bloody eyes that seemed badly fixed in place. Eyes that I somehow recognised. Mine. But I didn't want to believe it. Time to remember, the boy giggled. My eyes now. I'd suppressed most of what happened to me twenty years earlier, but in that moment the boy's vicious voice rang some distant bell in my traumatised brain. A boy jumping me in the street. A vicious beating. A sharp instrument plunging into my sockets. And those words. My eyes now. But that was 2003. It couldn't be the same boy. An ageless child with a blood-stained face withered hands and bulbous eyes, grinning at me in the reflection of the mirror. He couldn't be human. I feel bad, Mikey. Let me help you see. The malevolent thing smiled, walking away from the mirror and vanishing from my reflective field of view once again. I heard tussling at the radiator as the boy untied my dog, and Ted growled aggressively. Get off him! I cried jumping to my feet and lunging blindly forwards. Fingernails slashed into my cheek from an unseen assailant, and I fell back to the floor. I couldn't see the boy or my dog, not without the aid of a mirror, but I must have distracted the horrid thing for long enough to give Ted the upper hand. A loud growl sounded, followed by an inhuman screech. Paws pounded against the floor, and I felt the warm, familiar stench of Ted's breath on my face. Let's go, I yelled. I jumped to my feet a second time and headed onto the landing, Ted brushing against my side. We scurried downstairs, not daring to look behind us. Not that it would have benefited me. With my dog leading the way, we stumbled through the kitchen's side door and returned to the safety of the darkness. Back to the real world. Far from that horror house but it's still out there. I'm planning on moving away as soon as possible. 
I can still see that horrible red speck on the horizon from my bedroom window. The only visible thing in my darkened world. And I wish I hadn't seen what lived. Lives. Inside.